Hello and welcome to another episode of Iraqi Nutrition Podcast. I'm your host, uh, Juma Iraqi, and today I have with me Dr. Mike T. Nelson. Mike, how are you doing today? Hey guys, I'm doing good. Thank you very much for having me on here, and I'm very excited to talk about some super cool stuff we have coming up. Yeah, great. We're going to talk about HRV uh, today, and um, first off, thank you so much for agreeing to do this uh, interview. Oh yeah, of course. This is fun. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay, before we start uh, with the questions, could you give us a brief introduction about yourself? Sure. I'm a PhD. I did it from the University of Minnesota. And I looked at primarily exercise physiology stuff, both metabolism, uh, metabolic flexibility, and heart rate variability. Uh, the HRV study was one of them, which is not out yet, which may never see the light of day, who knows, it's just a comparison of HRV methods. Uh, the other one was looking at the effect of energy drinks on cycling performance, looked at some HRV stuff there also. Uh, previous to that, I actually worked in the medical device industry for almost 14 years, last of it was part-time, and I did a master's in mechanical engineering, more biomechanics type stuff. Uh, currently, I teach for Globe University. I do some work for Eat Perform with their uh, certificate for coaching, both nutrition and exercise, uh, director of education for the Mindset Performance Institute, and I do have some online clients and a few clients in person and um, a few other random and various projects too. So, Interesting. What type of clients do you work with? Um, right now I generally work with people who, I guess for lack of a better word, are more intermediate to some advanced, uh, just depends, and usually they're the ones who were pretty much stuck for some reason, whether their, you know, metabolism wasn't moving, quote unquote, or, uh, physical performance, more old injuries, um, things of, of that nature, where most of them have gone to kind of different places, nothing's really worked out, and so by some weird way, they've kind of found their way towards me. Okay, excellent. Okay, let's um, dive into the questions, and like I said, today's topic it's, is um, HRV. So the first question is, um, how is the nervous system affected by stress, both from training and um, everyday life? Yeah, so your nervous system, and for the definition here, we'll define that as autonomic nervous system. So that's the main nervous system in your body that runs a lot of sort of the quote-unquote background type uh, features. Most of it is unconsciously. So everything from you know regulating heart rate to digestion, blood flow, um, a lot of the stuff that you don't necessarily have to think about per se, which is good. And the autonomic nervous system is affected by stress. That can be both acutely and also chronically. And we know that if you get scared or you run into the what they call the classic uh, fight or flight syndrome, your body will put out a massive amount of sympathetic output, which is like stepping on the gas pedal on your car. And that allows you to you know, hopefully run from the lion or whatever is chasing you. So really, really high output but it's designed for a relatively short period of time. So this would be the same system if you're going to go to the gym and do like a one rep max, uh, things of that nature. Uh, the other arm of the autonomic nervous system is the parasympathetic side, which is more like the brake pedal on your car. It is also classically referred to as the rest and digest arm of your nervous system. And just like the name implies, so when you're more at rest, the parasympathetic system is actually going to be a little bit higher. So when your heart, as an example, is under what they call parasympathetic stimulation, it's actually decreasing the rate of your heart. Just like if you're pressing harder on the gas pedal of your car, it's going to slow your car down. And in reality, there's always a mix of parasympathetic and sympathetic going on at the same time. And how stress can affect that is, as I mentioned acutely, if you're walking along and ah, all of a sudden you see a tiger, you're going to try to run as hopefully as fast as you can, maybe not outrun the tiger, um, but you're going to have a massive sympathetic output and you're going to drop the parasympathetic also. So you want to go as fast as possible. 
And then after that, you'll be hopefully either, well, hopefully you make it alive. If you're not, you're dead and you don't have to worry about it. Um, and then you would be more in a rest and digest. So the parasympathetic uh, would be much higher. Uh, what happens, unfortunately, in most modern life is we have uh, stressors, so things that cause stress. And most of the time, these can be acute. So like if you go lift weights, you know, you're probably not going to lift forever. If your session is, let's say, an hour, and then you're going to go relax. The issue that people run into is, for example, if they work in a stressful job, and their boss is yelling at them all day, and they're they're sitting petrified in their chair, you know, pounding away on a keyboard. They've got a massive level of stress, and the stress is not necessarily short lived; it's more ongoing. And then, addition to that, is they've in essence decoupled their normal response from that, which is some type of movement. So when you see the lion, the tiger, or whatever scares you, you have a massive amount of movement but for a short period of time. So most people nowadays have much higher level of stress. The stress is a much longer duration, and the response is every time their boss yells at them, they can't go do sprints down the hallway, right? You're probably going to get fired. (laughs) So they've decoupled that movement response uh, from it also. And the body in general is very much survival-based. If you want to increase its performance, A better question to ask is how can you teach it to survive better? And at pretty much all costs, it's going to do everything so that it can survive. And unfortunately, if you have high amounts of chronic stress all the time, what you'll see is that the sympathetic arm of the nervous system initially will go up and up and up. The body is trying as hard as it can to keep up with all the demands. But unfortunately, at some point, it will switch rather rapidly to parasympathetic. In essence, I call it like feeling like someone pulled the string out of your back. So when people are training, right, if we see some model training, if you add more and more volume, you keep adding more intensity, you have an increased sympathetic output, keeps going up, keeps going up, your performance tends to trend down, you tend to feel worse, your sleep may get messed up. And there's some athletes who are very hard charging and been told their whole life that if we just keep trying harder, everything will work better. And so they keep pushing and keep pushing. And at some point, they can actually get into like an overtraining syndrome, where in essence, you can become very high parasympathetic. At that point, they're pretty much shut down and laying on the couch, kind of drooling on themselves. From a survival standpoint, your body was telling you, okay, we can't do this anymore. I'm trying to keep up. I'm putting out as much sympathetic. I'm, you know, have the gas pedal all the way to the floor. But at some point, you're going to torch the engine. And before you do that, I'm in essence going to put on the emergency brake and just completely shut you down. Um, it's pretty rare that you ever see a, a frank overtraining syndrome. It's not something you're going to run into by training hard for a couple of days or weeks or probably even months. But if you do, it's really hard to recover from that. If you're a highly competitive athlete, you're probably done at a high competitive level. Um, So all that to say that stress definitely does affect the nervous system. Um, Acute stress, it's pretty capable of handling that. Um, If the stress becomes chronic and becomes higher, and then now we start decoupling the normal physiologic survival response, which is some type of movement, now we start running into bigger and bigger issues and a bigger and bigger cost that you're going to have to pay for that. Excellent. And uh, it's great that you covered so much information about it because I think that a lot of people that train, they they focus on adequate sleep, they focus on solid nutrition, but they don't pay as much attention as uh, to stress management. Yes. And sometimes you go to the gym, you've had eight, nine hours of solid sleep, you've had enough uh, enough solid food in your system and still your performance suck basically. Oh yeah. 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 And we know one of the, the classic studies in this is from uh, Dr. Andrew Fry back in the nineties, took a group of Olympic weightlifters, had them come into the gym and they did, uh, I don't remember if it's singles or doubles, but uh, 90 plus percent of their one rep max. And then he had them come back the next day and the next day and the next day. I think the study went on for two weeks And the volume of it, the training, wasn't necessarily super high for a trained athlete, but the intensity was very high. 
And what he found was that performance after even, you know, a few days just just started dropping. And the athletes reported that they felt bad, they didn't feel good, their mood, they were cranky. And you could argue that that's probably more just a central nervous system effect. Granted, the volume does accumulate over time. But if people are in the gym and they're always pushing the intensity, they got to train beyond failure and, and train heavier all the time, you know, that even with adequate sleep and, you know, food and nutrition, that's definitely going to catch up to them. Excellent. Okay, so uh, since we're talking about um, training and uh, stress management, um, I thought that would be an excellent topic to talk about uh, HRV. So could you explain what HRV is? So HRV is, in English, the fine distance from one R wave to the next. So in essence, from one heart rate to the next. And we're looking at that on a very small scale, not necessarily a macro variation. So macro variation would be, well, I trained in the 120 to 140 range, and the next day I did heart rate of 170 to 180 beats per minute. We're actually looking at very small changes from one uh, beat to the next. So if you were sitting in front of me and, and we used to go back scale in time and years ago, the thought was that if you were at steady state and you were not doing anything, you're just laying down, your eyes are closed, you're doing nothing, that whatever your heart rate was should be very, very stable. There should not be any variability. If we were to measure you, it should be 65.0, 65.0, 65.0. <clears throat> it really shouldn't change that much at all. And what we found was that that's actually not true. If we were to measure you and you were healthy, we would see 63.4, 65.2, 67.1, 64.8. And we would see this variation that it would kind of oscillate a little bit around the average point. And those slight changes or variations are actually the heart rate variability. And to have those fine scale changes is a marker for health. You actually want that. You don't want your heart rate to be exactly like a metronome, 65.0, 65.0. That's actually bad. And it's a little bit counterintuitive to how people uh, think about it. So for years, I worked in a medical device industry. We made implantable uh, pacemakers and defibrillators. So the defibrillators were kind of you know the big ones you see on TV where they shock someone out of it. Exact same idea, but it was implantable and would entirely detect if you went into some weird rhythm and it would literally shock you out of it. And in those devices, in a subset of them, <clears throat> we would measure heart rate variability because it was a way to look and see if the treatment the device was providing, which is programmed by the physician, was that actually helping the patient? Was their variability, their heart rate variability getting better? If it was, that was a marker for health and that they were doing the right therapy for that. So HRV is looking at those fine scale differences. If you were to get up each morning and measure just your average heart rate, it gives you some pretty good information. Now, if you were to measure your heart rate variability, we can then take that data and determine what ratio of the parasympathetic versus sympathetic you are at. So just like before, we said the parasympathetic is the brake, sympathetic is more of the gas pedal. Now we can determine, are you becoming maybe more sympathetic-driven over time, or are you becoming more parasympathetic? It gives us the next level down of information, which also makes it a lot more useful. And that's just derived from looking at the fine-scale changes from one R-wave to the next. And what we find now is that fine scale variability uh, shows up in multiple places in the body. Uh, if we look at gait, it shows up there. If we measure body sway, it shows up there. It shows up in heart rate. And some of the PhD work I did was looking at uh, respiratory exchange ratios when you're hooked up to a metabolic heart. So what percentage of fats and carbohydrates you're using. Does that oscillate a little bit around a point, and does that maybe provide us some information? So the takeaway is that our rate variability is measuring this fine scale variability, and that allows us to determine what percentage of you are you parasympathetic or sympathetic at that time.
Okay, and what type, like, if you were to use this on yourself, what type of equipment would you use for this? Yeah, and that's the really nice part now. You can actually get programs that will run it entirely through your smartphone with either just a finger sensor or just a standard uh, low-energy Bluetooth heart rate strap. Um, when I was doing in the lab, when I started it, the equipment we had at eh, that time, if you were to go out and buy it, it, was probably around 10 grand or so. It was pretty expensive. And people had to come into the lab. It was like a three-step process of, you know, have them collect the data. And then we had to pull off the r -ways, And we had to do something with those. And then we had to take another program to run the math on it. And it was kind of complex and a fair amount of steps. And you had to do all this stuff. And it was expensive. Um, now there's programs, like I said, that run through your smartphone um, that will do all of that for you. And they've actually shortened the amount of time that it takes to capture the data. So the new ones now, as long as you're in a resting state, the point where the data is actually being captured is only about 60 seconds. So it's only about one minute. So total time you're looking at from the time you get up and measure to the time you get your data, eh, like three minutes maybe, five minutes at the very most. Uh, it's not really that bad. Uh, the system, my preference, is a system called iFleet. So instead of athlete, just replace it with an I, so iFleet. Um, they do have about, I think, one, two, three, four, four or five pieces of research now um, showing that it is accurate, um, that it is comparable to other systems, that the 60-second point uh, is adequate. And so it's pretty good data to show that it's uh, valid. And the total cost, even if you have to, you know, buy a heart rate strap and the app and everything is under like 90 US dollars. So, you know, not that expensive really compared to thousands of dollars, you know, just a few years ago. So it makes it a lot more applicable. And what we'll probably get into too is that HRV has to be baseline to the specific individual. And you need more than one data point to determine what's going on because you need a pretty good baseline because you're only looking at relative changes. Um, there is some data to show that if your HRV is super low, yeah, you're at a higher risk. If it's really high, uh, you may have less risk. But for trying to determine changes in training and other things, you really need a nice stable baseline in order to do that. So having it be on your phone, having it be something you can get up and just run each morning makes that whole process a lot more useful now. Okay, so uh, w um, you have the app and then you have another uh, device you buy f to... Um, so what type of other device do you use? You have one? Yeah, so I have one right here. Let's see, I don't have my phone, but everyone knows what a phone looks like, so yeah. no worries. So all it is is this is just old school uh, Bluetooth heart rate strap. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a Cardio Sport 1. And you just, you know, have this two electrodes on the back. Yeah. So you can tell this one's all pretty ratty and beat up. I've had it for like <clears throat> almost four years. But you just put that on in the morning. Uh, most people will do it in a seated position. Mm -hmm. If you are a pretty good endurance athlete or your resting heart rate's pretty low, if you do the measurement laying down, you can get something called parasympathetic saturation. In English, that just means that the changes in your training that you're trying to pick up will probably not show up in the measurement. In essence, they get just kind of washed out by this super high parasympathetic tone or the braking action at rest. But you have someone go to a seated position or standing. It's a little bit of stress because your heart has to work now against gravity, a little bit of sympathetic outflow. But because your position is the same, it's a constant. So you don't have to worry about it in the calculation. And that allows you to be a little bit more accurate so most people will get up. I tell people just if you have to use the bathroom, use the bathroom, <clears throat> sit back down on the side of your bed, put the heart rate strap on, you know, rest for maybe one, two minutes because you're you know, usually pretty rested when you, when you get up in the morning, you haven't done exercise or anything. Um, just close a little, little strap on here, <clears throat> run the application, and pretty good. So it's not too much more complicated than that. Um, you don't really want to do a ton of exercise or movement beforehand. Like I said, if you have to use a bathroom or walk down your stairs, not a huge deal. Just make sure you're resting when you grab the data. Um, if you do drink a 
a lot of fluid or eat anything that can screw up the measurement also. Um, but yeah, just do that and usually each morning and you're pretty much good to go with collecting data at that point. Okay, interesting. So how would you how would you use this in regards to to training based on the feedback you would get from from the from the app? Yeah, it if you look at the literature, it really depends on if you're more an endurance athlete or strength and power. We've got a lot more data on endurance athletes. For endurance athletes, it's pretty good at predictive, meaning that if your HRV is in sort of a good area that day for you, your performance is probably going to be pretty good. Now, there's huge exceptions to that at times, but in general, I'd say that's pretty good. Uh, if you're a strength and power athlete, yeah, not really that predictive. Um, there was some new data showing that if your HRV is a little bit lower, that was actually slightly more predictive for performance. So by lower, a lower HRV is more sympathetic. And that kind of makes sense, right? So if you're going to do, let's say, a powerlifting meet and you're super high parasympathetic, that means that you've got this heavy braking action on your nervous system probably not the best condition for maximum um, output in that case. Although powerlifting is not necessarily power, but performance, let's say. That if you're a little bit more on the sympathetic side, not super high, we don't want you to be overreached, that that was actually a little bit better for performance. So if I have a strength and power athlete, so I did this with a guy recently who qualified for Raw Nationals, this our whole taper with him was just watching his HRV. We did some stuff based on his history of performance in the past. He's a, he's a very good lifter. And we just watched his HRV was basically depressed. So we had a point where he was overreached, which is kind of what you want. We had plenty of time. So his HRV over time was gradually going down and down. He was very becoming sympathetic at that point. And then we started his taper. It kind of bottomed out. And then slowly started coming up, which means coming up. He's becoming more and more parasympathetic. His nervous system is recovering. He's getting rid of a lot of that accumulated fatigue. And then he actually dropped down just a little bit, I think like a day before the meet. And, you know, part of that is, is just timing and getting lucky, to be perfectly honest, the first time you run it with someone. Um, and, you know, he did really well and qualified for, for Raw Nationals. Doesn't always work out that perfectly, but that's kind of the scenario you would want with a strength and power athlete. The cool part about the HRV is that at least from the autonomic nervous system perspective, it tells you about where you're at and about how long. Because some athletes, you know, they can run a short taper and be good. Some may need three weeks. You know, it just depends on how much of that accumulated fatigue they have. You know, a lot of it's probably related to their aerobic base, how well they can um, recover. So in strength and power athletes, the mistake I made years ago was thinking that, oh, this is the, the be-all and end-all for prediction of performance. So I would say, okay, oh, good, my HRV is green, so it's good to go today. Today must be a good day. And then what I realized was I'm like, wait a minute, if it was kind of amber off or red, huh, what happens if I train today? Oh, oh, and sometimes I would get a pretty good performance. And then you get people that email you that's like, oh, I trained today, my HRV was horrible, and oh, I got a PR, ah, you know. <laughs> and what I found was that it, it's much better to look at HRV as the cost of what you have just done. So if you went out and let's say you trained yesterday and it was a good day, speed was good, you do a lot of strength and power stuff, maybe more volume, not sure what you're used to at that high of an intensity, and your HRV today tanks. Okay, that's just telling me that the, <clears throat> the cost on your nervous system was pretty high from that session. So maybe the next day you go out and do the upper hypertrophy dude bra type, you know, go to the gym, just get a pump and do, you know, bench press and whatever everyone else does on Mondays over here and <laughs> curls and whatever. And the next day, ah, your HRV is about the same. So that would tell me that in terms of the cost on your autonomic nervous system, wasn't really that high. And what that enables you is to determine kind of how to set up your training during the week. Now, if you're a strength and power athlete, you may be okay with your HRV being depressed for maybe 
one to two days. You know, if that's your top priority of the thing that you want to train, but it gives you the info to say that, okay, I'm not going to go back maybe the next day or maybe 48 hours isn't enough rest to go back. Or I may do an aerobic base day or I may do a hypertrophy day or something. So I think looking at it in terms of the cost of what that session was is much more useful than thinking of it in terms of prediction all the time. And as we'll get into too, your your lifestyle and everything else you do has a big factor on those too. Okay, excellent. A little more questions about the nervous system. And when we talk about stress and nervous system, stress we have from everyday life and, and training, uh, we often hear about the hormone cortisol. Sure. So could you tell us what uh, role it it has on uh, our stress levels and our nervous system because I think this hormone is quite misunderstood. People, oh think, totally, yeah. People think that you want to eliminate uh, as much cortisol as you as you want. So could you explain a bit about it? Yeah. So just like most things in the body, you want a good balance and you want it to be sort of timed appropriately. Um, <clears throat> bodybuilders years ago tried drugs that would actually crush your cortisol output temporarily and they almost died. <laughs> so highly not recommended at all. The flip side is if you have cortisol levels that are <clears throat> through the roof all the time and you're stressed out of your mind, everyone knows that that's not the best way to, to make your gains in the gym either. So what you want is an appropriate balance. So at its base level, cortisol is a hormone that's used to provide energy or to break down other things in the body for energy or classically a catabolic hormone. So most people go, oh my God, catabolic hormones, we don't want any of those things running around, that's horrible. But if you think about what happens when you train, when you're training, let's say weight training, you want as much energy as available as possible. So if we were to crush your cortisol output and have you go train, it's not going to go that good. So when you go to train or you're under some type of stress, you want cortisol levels to actually come up and to increase. And then once the stressor goes away, you want them to come back down again. Um, there is some literature to support this. Uh, Dr. Stu Phillips at his lab did a study looking at hormone levels and I believe it was hypertrophy or strength. I can't remember. I think it was hypertrophy. And what hormone levels were associated to that? You know, and all the, the dude bras are thinking, oh, it's it's got to be testosterone, you know, and all these other things. And and those do help. But from the acute sense of looking at the specific training bout, um, cortisol was actually the most associated with uh, successful training over a period of time. And that makes sense because you want cortisol to go up during training so you have the most amount of fuel available training you actually are breaking down some of the muscle fibers and all sorts of other things so you want that to actually go up but outside of the training you want it to go back down um, anecdotally there's some other studies from david west again from Stu phillips lab showing that uh, testosterone increases acutely within the physiologic range during training uh, are actually not associated to hypertrophy so it doesn't mean that you want you know, the testosterone levels of a 100-year-old guy, but acutely on your own for training, they're probably not as anabolic as we've been led to believe. So cortisol you want to come up during training and then go back down. So the, the two mistake people make, I believe, is having cortisol be too high all the time. So if you're stressed out out of your mind, you're drinking eight cups of coffee a day and you're proud of your four hours of sleep a night, I can guarantee you that over time, your cortisol levels are going to be pretty high. And that's going to have a pretty high cost associated with it. And you know, trying to add strength and hypertrophy or muscle, it's not going to go very well. So with cortisol, you want some, you want it at the right time, but we don't want it to be chronically elevated all the time either. Uh, worst case, you can... I think it's a, a disease called Cushing, Cushing disease? Yeah, Cushing's or Addison's. Yeah, so those are the two extremes of the spectrum where basically a crap ton of cortisol or almost very, very little. Yeah. And both of those disease states are not good. Yeah. <laughs> both of them have a lot of problems. Especially in terms of body composition. Because yes. you you basically lose a lot of um, muscle tissue 
and gain yep. a lot of fat tissue and especially in in the midsection where you you gain a lot yep so. yep and that's exactly what you see and there's pretty good associations with you know cortisol and uh, sort of belly fat as much as I hate that term but people understand what it means yeah. um, and it kind of makes sense right so if you look around again it's purely anecdotal you see a guy who's you know lifting okay but his lifestyle is just bonkers the stress is off the roof most of the time you see more fat in the midsection um, I know for myself that if I'm very stressed out, not sleeping, busy with other projects or whatever. And if I gain any weight, it's pretty much mostly in my face and mostly in the midsection, which if you talk to most guys, that's it's pretty typical. Yeah. So what can you do to to um, to manage your your stress? Well, obviously, adequate sleep, solid nutrition. But uh, is there any other recommendations that you have to? Managing your stress level, for example, is there any supplements that can be used or stuff like that? Yeah, so <clears throat> short answer on supplements, man, basic stuff helps, protein, creatine, fish oil, those are all more indirect. Um, there is some interesting data on some other ones, possibly uh, phosphatidylserine has been proposed to help with that. I've played around with it. I didn't notice a huge difference, to be honest. Um, anecdotally, other people report, meh, seems to help them. I've tried it with a few clients. Some seem to respond good to it. Some don't respond at all. The little bit of literature that's on it shows that it's much more of a chronic effect. You probably need four, six, eight weeks of it to potentially see an effect. And even then, it only seems to help people who are really, really stressed out. Um, the downside with it is it's also from a raw material standpoint probably one of the more expensive supplements you can buy. So a while ago I looked at um, uh, purchasing some of it for a project that never panned out and the raw material cost of it is very high. Um, other raw materials now are relatively inexpensive. I mean creatine is like dirt cheap now. Um, so that kind of makes it a little bit more prohibitive. Uh, my preference for the best thing is sleep. So sleep makes a massive difference. Having people get to bed earlier, maybe sleep in a little bit later, that's kind of debatable, but definitely getting to bed earlier, doing all the wonderful things you've heard about to get better sleep. So that makes a big difference. Um, in terms of more stress control, I do like a lot of the breathing stuff, although that ends up being kind of woo-woo. But we do know that if you become stressed, we do know that your breathing shifts. Your breathing shifts to using more they call classically upper chest, away from belly breathing. Both of those are probably a little bit too oversimplified. But again, if we go back to the analogy of the tigers chasing you, your body goes, okay, I need to do everything possible to survive. And I'm going to use a lot of the muscles in the upper part of the neck. So SCM, scalings, things of those natures. Because your neck is stable and when they contract, they actually lift up the rib cage a little bit to allow you to pull more air in. So under max exercise, that's an awesome thing. You want to do everything possible to get your ventilation as high as you humanly can. If you're at rest, you don't need to do that. Um, so a lot of clients, I teach them how to not breathe from their upper chest. Most of the time, it's an unconscious thing that they don't know they're doing. right? So if you think about breathing, the cool part is that we do have some conscious control over it. If I told you to hold your breath, you can do it. If I tell you to breathe faster, you can do it. But no one's ever died from forgetting to breathe, right? You know, so it can uh, go back to an unconscious control then too. Sort of just like blinking is the other one too. What's nice about that is with some retraining, you can then retrain them over time, which does take a fair amount of time because of how many breaths you take per day to become more diaphragmatic breathing. Again, your diaphragm is always working. It's not like it took a lunch vacation and doesn't work anymore. But trying to offload a lot of the, the muscles in the upper traps and the neck. And usually I always ask clients, you know, are your upper traps tight? Does your neck get tight? Do you get headaches? And it's pretty common that most of them would say yes. So I think breathing retraining will help. The simplest one you can do is just called a high-low breathing. You just put, whoops, microphone, uh, one hand over your chest, one hand over your stomach. 
and try to get the one on your stomach to go up and down a little bit more. I don't like that from a pure mechanic standpoint long term, but from the short term of just trying to get them more aware to not use their upper chest to breathe all the time, I think is good. Um, PRI, so Postural Restoration Institute, has some really good stuff on more in-depth breathing that's been very useful. But simplest thing is just take, you know, slower inhale, slower exhale, you know, try to breathe more in your stomach. Those basic things will help people quite a bit. You can get a little bit fancier. There's an app called the Breathe Sync, and you just place your finger over the camera, and you hit start. And it's looking at the variability changes in your pulse pressure in your finger. So in essence, an HRV marker. And it's trying to then time your breathing to it. And they're trying to hit something which is called coherence. And that's been pretty useful, like three minutes, three times a day, to help increase more of a parasympathetic from the heart rate variability standpoint. Um, so I would say sleep's really good. Some supplements, maybe. Uh, breathing is probably the biggest one. And the last thing on breathing is that breathing becomes a good indicator to determine when you are becoming more stressed. Because most people are so stressed all the time that they lose the awareness of when they're actually stressed. All right, so if a lion came out and chased them, oh, they would know that. But they're so used to their boss yelling them at them all day that they don't realize they sit at their chair like this, scared out of their mind. So I'll ask them, I'll even email clients during the day, you know, if you can take your shoulder and pull it down, that means it was probably up, right? If you ask them, are your shoulders up? They're like, no, no, they're, they're fine. Um, so if you ask them if you can pull your shoulders down, oh, okay. You know, so that's an indication that they were probably a little bit more stressed. Okay, excellent. Long-winded answer, but... Yeah, it was the answer was perfect, and thank you so much for the great tips that you provided. All right, Mike, thank you so much once again for doing uh, this interview. If yeah, if people want to read more about you, where can they find that information? Sure, uh, best bet is just the website, which is just uh, MikeTNelson.com, and I'll have uh, somewhere they can opt in there to the newsletter. Uh, most of the information I put out now is primarily through the newsletter, but I'll have a bunch of articles and a bunch of other stuff there that uh, they can read. If they have any direct questions for me, they can feel free to email me. It's just uh, Dr. Mike, which is D-R-M-I-K-E, at MikeTNelson.com. Just in the subject line, just put podcast question, and my assistant will get it over to me, and I will be able to get back to them. Uh, most emails make it through, but every once in a while, a few get spammed out, so just feel free to drop me a line again. Okay, excellent. Thank you once again, Mike, and uh, have a nice day. Yeah, thank you very much. Greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye.